Uh, so uh, I'll start with uh, so uh, I'll start with uh, my work at Royal Stack, uh, where uh, we started. We were kind of, you know, compelled to use Go for one of our services. So uh, Royal Stack is traditionally uh, Ruby on Rails, uh, you know, inclined towards Ruby. Then uh, we realized, you know, certain sort of problem we cannot solve in Ruby on Rails. We prefer uh, Node for that kind of thing. Uh, for services, Node is an OK idea, but we found a use case in which Node was a really uh, not great uh, option. What happened was uh, one of our products at Browser Stack, it is very network intensive. From our customers, thousands or tens of thousands of HTTP requests are made in one session, in, in a very quick succession. And uh, they are really concerned about how soon all, let's say, 10,000 requests can be made. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, you know, like, uh, we can solve a lot of things in programming, but we cannot change speed of light. We cannot, if you are making thousands of requests from India to a server in the US, at the end of the day, you cannot uh, make it faster than for somebody who is making the same request from US to US. So the requirement was, you know, we wanted to give a good indicator to our customers that, you know, uh, you should expect this to be slightly slow if you are coming from a far off region where the servers are not located. So, uh, for the, the solution for that uh, is uh, ping. The easiest way to tell uh, how, how far away you are is to do a ping. We send a packet, we receive a packet response back, hopefully, and we find out how long it takes. Now, this one simple application is uh, you know, we have a command line tool, ping is a very easy sounding problem, but ping is a very difficult problem because uh, it's, it's built on top of ICMP, um, unlike TCP IP or UDP, where uh, when you're communicating with a, with a remote machine or a different machine, you are sending a, Mac, a packet intended for a certain packet, uh, sorry, sorry, certain socket, and that socket is owned on the receiving side by a certain application. Operating system only sends the packets that are meant to you uh, on your own port. For example, Apache will only receive packets meant on port 80 and a few other ports. Uh, in case of ICMP, there is no such thing of socket, so you end up sending packet to you know ICMP. So any process which is receiving ICMP packet receives all ICMP packets. And ICMP is also sent by other things like you know it's used for network uh, optimizations at some levels. So if if we would have started sending packets in using Node or Ruby or or a higher length language, we would have had uh, to parse all the packets that are coming for all, all sorts of this thing. And it was not a great idea to parse network packets in uh, in a language like Node and uh, so we, we were forced to look into maybe Java and Go at that time. And Go turned out to be reasonably fun. Uh, so one of the things that I noticed after we deployed uh, this service, this service uh, exposed certain aspect about programming. We, what I realized after building the service is a lot of programmers who were otherwise quite good programmers found this particular service a little uh, strange because it's, it's already uh, breaking the paradigm of a traditional uh, web development. So, uh, so, so I realized that the programmers usually kind of, you know, the web developers uh, can be kind of classified into two different realities. You know, certain programmers think in one fashion, and some other programmers think in slightly other fashion. And, you know, uh, to understand which, you know, uh, in order for us to grow, for, I feel, we should understand where we are and we should move. So I'll try to uh, say that uh, the two realities are, one of them I, I noticed from my experience is that, you know, those guys who are from, you know, the LAMB stack, the LAMB guys, the guys who have done PHP or maybe even Django and Rails, even the node-based stack, they tend to be, you know, thinking in a certain way. And, and then we have, uh, 
there are several people, you know, people writing big Java applications, C++, uh, Erlangbo, lots of monolithic servers are there. Now, some of them are not web, but a lot of them are also web. And I feel that the fundamental, there's a significant difference in the mindset of these two uh, guys. I want to explore that here. Yeah. So, so, uh, so there are many uh, differences already among these two guys. So, uh, we like to think that Django Rails is more fun than Java, which is kind of more boring. Uh, static and dynamic, we already know. Django, etc., or maybe 2.0, you know, versus Java is a little bit older. Uh, Rails guys are very good at, you know, give me a problem, I'll quickly implement a solution. They are, they measure their <coughs> goodness in terms of how quickly they can implement a feature, whereas, you know, uh, the, the Java or C++ guys do not really, they, they, they end up writing, you know, typically much bigger code. And uh, other differences, you know, obviously, uh, Java, etc., is slightly faster than Django or, or Rails. Uh, but we don't really... Other difference is that startups, etc., seems to have more bias towards the LAMP gang compared to the corporate people who are... It's not very uh, accurate, but, you know... Uh, and then some people can say that, you know, one of those guys are better programmer than another, and it is kind of accepted that, you know, let's not comment on that. But uh, I feel that one of them is slightly better than another because of some reasons that we will see in this talk. So the most, uh, to me, the most fundamental dividing line between those two gangs is, you know, uh, their attitude about can data live in the RAM. You know, uh, a typical LAMP guy, you know, Django, Rails, whatever, will be thinking, no, I mean, uh, their, their this thing is they will start designing a system, they will maybe start with the database schema or maybe uh, uh, some sort of, you know, even with Mongo, you think you have some sort of notion about, you know, you're going to have objects like users, objects like tasks, you're going to have a relationship between users and tasks, you know, and you model them in, in either Mongo-like thing or in, in MySQL-like thing. Uh, and, and they tend to uh, put everything inside databases and they kind of do not have, like this, this is my experience that uh, none of my Django projects tended to have any significant data stored in the RAM. Uh, whereas servlet people, if you ask those guys, they will typically, you know, they will say yes. They, they would obviously still prefer MySQL, Mongo, Redis, file system, etc. You know, no need to invent something which is already, reinvent something which is already there and perfect, or at least uh, fairly debugged and solving a lot of problems. But for them, for their realities, the fact that you can have significant amount of data or interesting, um, interesting data in the RAM I feel it, it exists, or it's, it's there in the horizon. They can just, that's one tool that they can quickly reach out to when they're solving problems. They're not constrained to using MySQL, Mongo, et cetera. And what is the reason why we have this kind of uh, divide? Uh, I feel it's, it's, it's because of restarts. It's because of the stability. At the end of the day, Node has got a lot of uh, memory leaks. I mean, even today, our Node services in production, we, I mean, the best solution we have is we'll restart it after, you know, every so often. It's, it's kind of a joke, and we kind of have optimized how to restart a service without affecting our customers, but there's no such thing as graceful restart. The only thing graceful is that you do not restart, or you restart when you intend to, you know. Uh, in case of several people, you know, they, they, Java, or typically Tomcat, you will not see crash. You know, uh, if it happened, probably it happened because of some fundamental problem. Um, out of memory or some, some fundamental misconfiguration in a setup or something like that. Or, you know, if they are, if they are too, you know, constrained by deadlines, they don't have time to write the perfect program, so they might say, okay, you know. But, uh, so, so taking into this, the key consideration that uh, a LAMP can has, uh, the key paradigm that they have is, you know, it's a request response model. So you don't worry about what happens before the request. You don't worry about what happens the response, whether it is the same process which is responding to the next request response or not, because the process could have restarted in between. In fact, uh, the standard way, uh, the recommended way to deploy a Django or Rails, etc., is to always have multiple processes. In case of 
let's say if you're deploying a Java process or a C++, you will not immediately say, I will run you know, 20 Tomcat instances. In general, in Java, you do not run more than one instance of Java, or you prefer not to run more than one instance of Java on one, one machine. <laughs> so, so they have a long running process, and the moment you have long running process, all sorts of uh, possibilities open up. So, so why why should we care about data in the RAM? You know, we have you know we can already imagine the the negatives of data in RAM is already clear to everyone. If the process dies, you know you will lose the data. But uh, but there are uh, certain very strong reasons. You know, uh, Redis is called the Swiss knife of data structures. I think that's one of the marketing lines they use. The the bottom line is. Uh, you know the JSON way of thinking, where everything is either you know int, string, or list and dictionary. Like the only data structure that we think about is the array and a dictionary or hash map of some sort, is not sufficient for you know certain problems. Certain problems uh, are could be done better. For example, if you use, uh, let's say, if you have to do a prefix search, it's you're sure MySQL etc. can do you do an index on that and can take care of this thing. But let's say, I mean, the moment you start thinking it's possible and it's good, and I did, you'd see that Java guys tend to, or C++ guys tend to have a lot of uh, data in memory, the, the indexes, the caching stuff. I'll, I'll take that. Another, another uh, key uh, reason why you have to have data in memory is, uh, you know, where the data is ephemeral, like a socket. Now, uh, if you are trying to build a poker game uh, app where there are lots of rooms, now, uh, it, for, for, a, for a lot of online real-time games, the games, the rooms uh, are played in, in a very turn-to-round basis and very short-lived. They are not something that you know, are ideal candidates for storing in MySQL. You don't want to store all moves in MySQL, or you don't want to store who is who is part of this table in MySQL? Because, because who includes a socket? And at the end of the day, socket is owned by, let's say, you know, one particular process, and you, it, it, that socket object doesn't make sense from a different process point of view. So that has no value, uh, you know. So you would be forced to have some sort of in-memory data structure to manage all the sockets belonging to all the people who are part of this room. You know, and if you're already doing keeping track of sockets, then you can as well keep track of a few other things and save yourselves a few, you know, uh, you can start thinking from, from this thing. So, <clears throat> another why, why you should uh, consider about memory, uh, storing data in memory is, uh, you know, process and network boundaries. At the end of the day, you are, if you are really, really worried about milliseconds, you know, you have to worry about milliseconds. There is a cost, a penalty, when you're going from your process to another process. There's a whole optic system will schedule or deschedule your process, schedule some other process, it will do a lot of work. Uh, in case of network, it becomes even more. You are also incurring the TCP-related overheads and so on. So, and also uh, related to that is the serialization overhead. Now imagine two scenarios. Uh, Consider cache systems, which is a very typical use case for, uh, you can say, using this, is uh, if you have got a memcache, which is, memcache is nothing but a simple key value data store. You just have a string as a key, and the value is some whatever binary object, and uh, you serialize it and store it. But there's virtually, like, very, there's a very strong, this thing, if you can, you know, if you, can put the cache inside the process. There are a lot of advantages. If you can make sure that the, you know, uh, if if all the cache hits are getting you know met inside the process, you are not incurring the network overhead. You are not incurring the cross-process overheads. You are not incurring the serialization overheads. And uh, you know so, and they are also kind of a decent match. Uh, your web application is kind of CPU hungry. Your cache system is typically RAM hungry. So if you can merge those two processes together, you can kind of, you know, you'll have to worry about a lot of stuff like, uh, in case of cache system, the typical thinking is like this, that if I have uh, 10 web application servers and one cache system, you know, uh, those cache 
uh, can be reused. If, if some, one of those processes has created something in the cache, that cache value would be accessible from the other processes. But basically, what you have saved is RAM. Instead of having you know, 10 GB on each process, you kind of have 10 GB at one place. It's, it's, it's a trade-off uh, in, in, in which many things are involved. But uh, if you can put cache near your process, it's a it's good thing. It's, uh, you'll see a lot of people who are using Go would be uh, uh, considering this kind of thing. So why Go? What's the meaning of this talk in a Go like thing? So Go is, uh, in the comparison, this thing, Go actually belongs to the, you know, the right side of, you know, the better side of all, all of these. It is fun, it's not boring, it is, you know, static, so it has all the advantages. It is obviously Web 2.0, it is kind of fast because of the system uh, packages and so on. Uh, so getting things done is also kind of fast. It is fast as are this thing, startups are using it. And, and Go kind of encourages you uh, to think about stuff which you usually do not think about in a typical Rails or Node program, which is, you know, how to manage locks, for example. Very soon you will have locks. You think, uh, very soon you will have, if not locks, you're thinking about communicating over channels, you will have lots of channels and then you'll have to start worrying over if the channel is buffered or not buffered. So it kind of makes you a, a better programmer. Uh, so, so what else is Go? Go is fast. Uh, Go has good concurrency. If you're putting a lot of data, you have to start thinking about concurrent access to that data because that data might, uh, that sub, the process might be handling a lot of concurrent requests. Lots of HTTP requests could be coming and you want to uh, properly handle them. Uh, Go is high level as well as low level. It lets you use pointers when it makes sense to you. It lets you access you know, very high level HTTP libraries when you want to do that. Um, Go has a, you know, what I think is a manageable memory model. It has garbage collection, so it kind of stops. You don't have to think about a lot of typical problems, but it also has, you know, uh, in case of, let's say, for example, Java, when you try to store an integer inside a collection, it kind of goes from four bytes to, you know, 16 bytes. So, so Go tends to more uh, conservative about memory than even the other languages. So it's, uh, when, when you're thinking about putting a lot of data in memory, then you have to worry about how much data you have, how much memory you have, how much byte per, per record you are storing. And for that, Go is right. And the consideration that, that makes Go quite interesting is this, that because of the error handling, your program kind of tends to be a little bit more bug-free. So when you start thinking about <coughs> storing data in RAM, the primary consideration, you know, is the primary consideration. If the data that you're trying to store in RAM is the primary data or not. A lot of things that will, you will, decisions that you will make afterwards is going to depend on this. So if the data, if you're lucky, uh, if the data is not the primary source of data, you can recover or fetch that data, it's a cache kind of scenario, then you kind of uh, uh, don't have to worry much and you only have to worry about how much data you can store in the RAM and how fast your uh, for loops can, how, how quickly you can, uh, you, it will depend on your data structures and your algorithms. But if, we, if the, the data that you're trying to store is primary, and I'm here to say that, you know, it is kind of okay to be in a situation where you store primary data also in memory, you uh, do not have to kind of think that uh, data can never, can only be stored persistently in the standard data, data sources. You can uh, you can do these things with with, with with go. So so imagine that scenario. If you are uh, trying to do that, you have a to do system, uh, and you decide, okay, my to dos will be stored in memory uh, on my go, and I will not have any any database to back it up. You know, my go program would act as the database. You know, so in order to model this to do, you will have a bunch of structs. For models, you'll have a user struct, you'll have a to-do struct, you'll have a few other things. Then you'll have global collections, which will most likely be a global pointer to a dictionary or a slice or uh, one of those data structures that you feel is suitable for 
your application. Uh, you'll typically have a bunch of reads and writes. I prefer to split them into these. So this, this, you, you'll have a lot of for loops. It will depend on how have you organize your data. You will probably have a bunch of locks. So, so all of this will, you know, using this and all the techniques you have known, learned about Go, you can kind of manage to store data in RAM. But the real problem is, you know, what happens if the process goes down? So in that scenario, there are two, two ways to handle these situations. One, one is called checkpoints uh, of sorts. Uh, basically, the idea is that you take your entire memory data structure and you somehow serialize it on a disk. Uh, you take a full memory dump. You can uh, write a routine to just copy everything to a JSON or some binary format and store it on a disk. The problem with this is uh, it is a stop the world kind of operation because while you're copying this, the other requests you cannot kind of, and this can be a, a long process, so that's kind of a problem. Uh, in case of Redis, uh, it's a single threaded C program. It, there's an advantage, extra advantage when you're trying to do this, is in case of, uh, so Linux provides you fork. Fork means that uh, if you have one GB of data in your process memory, and if you fork, that one GB doesn't become two GB. It, both of them have access to kind of the same data, and there's a copy on write semantics. So initially, each of them will be referring to the same page or same, same area on the RAM. And when one of the process writes to any of the pages, that pages will be duplicated. And so Linux will take care of that. And that gives a very good tool to if you want to do a memory dump. So you just fork and you dump. You cannot do that in Go. So checkpoint is kind of a little bit interesting or difficult. But uh, the other approach that people use, uh, you know, all, all the databases have some sort of uh, log implementation. MySQL has a binary log. PostgreSQL has a uh, write ahead log. Somebody else has, you know, ahead of time, or I don't know. There are different names for this same key idea. The key idea for, for write logs is that in, in all your writes, wherever you're modifying the data, you, you know, you serialize the, that function call invocation somehow. So if somebody is creating a new user, so there would be somewhere new user function or a new note, a new note function. That new note function, along with updating the data in memory, will also generate lead to a log line, which will get somehow get serialized and stored in a file system. And when the process restarts, it will first read all the binary logs. It will reconstruct the entire thing in memory, and uh, you know. Uh, we have the data back after the application really started. Uh, so these, these two techniques actually kind of have to work together. The problem with write logs is, you know, write logs tend to become really, really huge. Uh, if you're modifying the same user, you know, let's say last access time for users, you will end up modifying it every time a HTTP request is made for that user's behalf. So, <coughs> so write logs tends to become big and they are always growing where your actual data may not be actually growing at that pace. So what you can do is, you know, you can do, or uh, you can take the write log, feed it to a slave, uh, get the slave to do a checkpoint, full memory dump. So you have some sort of checkpoint. From this checkpoint onwards, you have a lot of write logs. So you periodically, uh, you know, kind of compressing the write logs by periodically taking checkpoints. And so, on. so this is like one of the uh, ways. This is kind of uh, you know all there is. I mean, there there are other stuff databases do, especially related to transactions that we don't have to kind of worry. But this is like it's like it's not something that you cannot do. It's something you should consider in your program. When you go back, you should consider where are are the possibilities where we can actually do this. It's not something we get. Uh, so. What kind of guarantees people uh, require when you're storing uh, data in RAM? There are various levels of guarantees, and you can uh, you can say, okay, uh, a function call will sometimes like you have already started writing, it will sometimes terminate, uh, or you can force that you know I will not return till I have actually written, or you can say I will not return till 
I have written and some other slave has written, or maybe you know a bunch of slaves. Different like uh, uh, the Hadoop file system, I think, uses a bunch of semantics where you write to a bunch of places and then it is successful. In case of you know, so you can figure out what you want and you can use uh, that. So yeah, there's a final caution. You know, there are two rules of optimizations. These 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 were optimization related stuff. You don't want to do it. Uh, unless you have measured it and proved that this kind of thing is needed. But if you want to come to it, it is there. You can use it. Yeah, so. <laughs> this is that. Thank you. <laughs>